Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank Ute for inviting me. Um, so this is a slight detour from what we heard so far. Of course, the I will join at the end. And, and um, this is what I do for a living. I study uh, nanoscale systems out of the globe. My office is right above our heads. So I study things like photosynthetic systems and nanoparticles that you shine light on them and something called molecular junctions, which is basically electronic wires made of single molecules. This is what I do for a living, which kind of begs the question, um, what qualifies me to talk in front of this audience? And so there are three parts to the answer. The first is that for some reason, I'm not sure. Even in my scientific work, I tend to go against the flow. I don't know why this happens. Maybe it's a, a you know, trait of character, but maybe it's genetic. Uh, um, you can see titles like, is photosynthetic complexes used quantum coherence to enhance efficiency? Probably not, you know, which might, you know, make some people angry. And, and you know, this is a, a William of Oakham. And this is a picture from one of our a, a abstract figures. So in a lot of my work, a, a kind of pushed me against the current. So I have a little feeling of how it feels like to go against the current. Um, the other thing is that I'm a fairly outspoken climate realist or climate skeptic uh, or a climate rationalist. And I speak quite uh, uh, openly against uh, catastrophic climate change. I've become somewhat of a persona in Israel public life so much that a former member of Knesset Alon Tal compared inviting me to a conference like inviting a Holocaust denier to a European jury conference. So I kind of know how it feels like to go against uh, uh, the common uh, party line. The third qualification is that I actually teach philosophy of science and I do this uh, from the viewpoint of a practitioner which is what, since that's what I do for a living. And thinking about philosophy of science in the last couple of years um, kind of uh, led me to rethink what it is that I'm doing or what it was that I was doing for the last 15 years and, and shine a, a light on this. For example, it led us to write a, a paper which uh, uh, questions the, the methodology of papers like the famous 99% consensus on climate change and things like that. This is now under review, so I hope it will be out soon. So uh, um, what I want to talk to you about is biases in the knowledge system. And this is what I would call an applied epistemology a, a issue. And it's very, very important, I think. And it, it's related to everything that we're going, that we've heard and, and already going to hear. And, um, I have to tell a little story. I hear at BGU, I grew up here. My father was a professor. He was a physical uh, nuclear physicist in the uh, nuclear engineering department. And as a young kid, I roamed the halls of the university. You know, you come in, you see these big building people walking around, you know, with their heads. And I didn't really understand what's going on here. So as I grew up a little bit, I asked him, Dad, what, what's this place? So he told me, and this is a true story. My mother is here in the audience, so she can uh, corroborate. Uh, um, son, the university is a place that accumulates knowledge. So that's a strange thing. So I asked him, how do they do that? So he told me, when students come into the university, they know very little. When they leave the university, they know nothing. The difference was accumulated by the <laughs> university. So, of course, this is... a. Uh, um, an interesting way to look at academia, but it, you know, it's really important to try to understand what, we, what it is that we are doing here. And uh, to do that, all you need to do is go to the ethics code of BGU. There's a written document called BGU Ethics Code. And the first statement is what the university is. And the fundamental aim of the university is to seek, investigate and teach the truth to promote all fields of knowledge. And everything else is derived from that. So the goal, the aim of the university is written. We know what it is. It is to seek, investigate, and teach 
the truth. Of course, truth and knowledge are, are things that we need to understand. And, and, and Andrea already talked about this, so you made my life a little easier. I can uh, switch through this fairly fast, right? What is truth? Well, we kind of understand, and I'm not gonna go deep into the philosophy here. In mathematics, it's very easy. Truth is any statement that comes out of the axiom, right? You can prove something and then it's true. In uh, the physical sciences, it's a little more delicate. Two is a statement reflecting observations of the world. Uh, in, in Spinoza's uh, language, this is Pachi Naturae, the, the face of nature. What is, is true. If you've measured it, then the measurement outcome is the truth. Of course, this has its limitations and so on, but we kind of understand what true is. It's what is, is true. All the rest are, you know, the stories we tell ourselves. So, Truth is one side of the thing, and knowledge, right? We need to pursue knowledge in the university. That's the aim. So how do we know things, right? This is epistemology 101. Well, there are basically four ways of knowing things. One is knowledge from the divine. If you are lucky enough, you will receive knowledge to, you know, directly from, from the divine. That's not very common. So we're not going to use that a lot. A much more common practice is knowledge from authority, right? Someone heard it from the divine and is passing it on to us. Of course, these ways of knowing are not very useful to science, right? We all know this. So we need to use other ways of knowing. And there are two major ways of actually knowing things in the scientific method. Is knowledge by observation. This is Miran, he was a former student in our lab and he's actually observing nanoscale particles through a microscope. So knowledge by observation, we look at the world around us and we see the truth because what we see is the truth by definition, right? So observation is one thing. And of course the fourth uh, way of knowing, which is as important as observation is logic. And this is a, a, my student explaining to my postdoc through logical arguments, what happens when you pass current through a molecular junction? And I have no idea what they're talking about. This is typical, typically the case, but the use of logic is essential, right? This is the tool that we use to, to explain the observation as part of the scientific method. So the never ending circle of scientific inquiry can really be summarized very simply. And of course you can be a, a, a hardcore Popperian or a Kunian or anything in this spectrum, but you would understand that the cycle is always the same. You have an observation, oh, sorry. You have an observation, you use logic, right? To come up with a thesis. What is a thesis? It's an explanation to the observation based on a general rules. In physics, we call them laws of nature, but you can uh, uh, use other forms of uh, basic rules. And you again use logic to generate from this thesis some kind of prediction, what you should also see. And then you test this with a new observation or with an old observation, and you either corroborate the thesis or falsify it. Right? This is the kind of the standard tool for any science and any field of inquiry in general. And of course, there are deviations and there are uh, uh, arguments on the limits and it's just, but basically this is the story, the never ending story of the scientific inquiry. Of course, this only happens in the ivory tower of academia, right? This is how I try to do things. And you know, some of the people here who are in academia, but we are not an ivory tower. This is not an island. We are, you cross the street and you are in the city. And the question is not how do I, me as a scientist know things, that's an important question, but it's not the question I want to talk about. The, the question I want to talk about is how do people know? How does the public know things? That's a whole different question because the, 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 the typical person is not a scientist. Thank God for that. So uh, there are other ways that uh, 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 the, the public gets his knowledge and this is generally uh, dubbed the knowledge system. This is a term coined by Alex Epstein, who's a philosopher and talks a lot, about, a lot about energy and things like that. 
And the knowledge system is the system of institutions in which uh, the population receives this knowledge. And uh, uh, Alex uh, um, uh, uh, divides it into four parts. The first part is us, the researchers, right? We do the basic science. We use the tools of observation and logic to generate a, a knowledge. And then there are the synthesizers, right? The people who look at all the science that was gathered, all the information, the knowledge that was gathered by researchers and synthesizes into reports or into books or into things like that. And they a, a kind of synthesize these things. And there are many, many examples, for example, a government committees, or, or a, a public forums or private companies who generate reports, things like that. I, since I'm in the climate business for a while, I will be mostly giving examples from the climate a, a, a discussion. So the climate discussion, the main synthesizer we know is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And I will give some examples. And after the synthesizer, there are the disseminators the people who take this information and actually spread it around. And these are, of course, uh, news outlets, media, uh, um, social media, teachers, things like that. And the final link is the evaluator, the people who take this knowledge. And of course, they are also take this knowledge not directly from the researchers, that's very, very rare, but they take it from other sources and they say, okay, what to do with this knowledge? So these are the four uh, uh, pillars of the knowledge system. And Alex Epstein kind of imagines this as a linear chain where information flows from the researchers to the synthesizer to disseminators and evaluators. And he highlights, uh, uh, okay, sorry. And of course, each part of the system is composed of humans. And humans are a, a, a prior to incentives and biases. For example, in researchers, this is well known, we all, feel it, and many of us feel it, uh, are, are a, a prone to academic pressures, peer pressure, political bias, funding bias, and status bias, right? We all want to, to do well. A, a synthesizers, of course, are also a, a, have incentives of their own. They are limited, first of all, by the knowledge accumulated by the researchers. So if uh, um, there is, that's also a certain bias, of course, political bias, because these are committees and there's public attention. If you are in a committee, you want people to listen to you. So that's another incentive or bias. And of course, the a bias of self-preservation, again, given the example of climate, and I'm not saying anything about, you know, CO2 in the atmosphere at this point. I'm just pointing to the general uh, uh, structure. If there is a committee, right? whose charter is to discuss the dangers of climate change to humanity, right? And this is written in the charter. What are the chances that the committee will say there are no dangers? You can dismantle this community, right? The probability for that is very, very small, especially if it's funded by millions of dollars. So it's an inherent bias. I mean, it doesn't mean that what they say is going to be wrong, but it is a bias. And it's in every committee. Every synthesizer has this kind of bias. Of course, the disseminators are, are, have completely different incentives and biases. They have political agenda and they have, of course, financial incentives and these are all intertwined with one another. And eventually the evaluators, they have politics and agenda and they have a, a, the popular vote. They need to be reelected in democracies. So this is also a, a bias or an incentive which needs to be accounted for. And, and what Alex Epstein did is pointed out the flaws in these two steps in, in, in the knowledge system, mainly the synthesizers and the senators. Let me just give you a, a brief example. So uh, 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 in the climate discussion, the main synthesizer is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And they come out with a report every few years. It's a very, very well-known thing. And uh, uh, in this entire report, which discusses the physics of climate change and the effects of the climate on humanity, you, for example, do not see the simple fact that in the last 120 years, the, the number, the, the nominal number of deaths from extreme climate events have reduced by a factor of, you know, one over 50. So 120 years ago, 
on average, half a million people per year would die from climate disasters. And now it's about between five and 8,000 people a year. Although we have uh, increased the population by eight. And this kind of uh, uh, thing should appear in you know, how climate affects humanity, but it's not there in, this, in the science. Nor does the fact that, for example, coal kills much, much more people than hot temperatures, you know, factor of four in the Western countries up to factor of 20 in the developing countries. So you can see the biases in, in the, in the uh, synthesizer report. It's just, it's, they're very, very obvious. And of course, <laughs> it's very, uh, very easy to find uh, uh, examples of disseminators which uh, uh, are completely wrong. I have two examples here. I, I'm, I'm going to briefly show them. This is an example from the Israeli uh, uh, paper Globes. It, say, it says here, climate change is happening faster than predictions, right? And, and there's, a, there's an air of urgency to the fact. But when you go and read the paper, you actually see that this is not what the paper says at all. The paper actually says, the inability of climate models to accurately capture the storm track intensity, which delays the detection of intensification in models by several decades, questions the skill of climate models to accurately assess the future changes, etc. So the paper is a scientific paper telling us that the climate models are really pretty bad because we compare the calculation to reality and there's a very strong discrepancy. And the paper says, uh, uh, we shouldn't trust climate models at this point. And the newspaper says, oh, climate change is happening way faster, just because the change was in some positive direction rather than that. It doesn't at all say what this thing says. Here's another amazing example. And, you know, Google this. Did you know that third of Pakistan was underwater in August due to uh, floods? Now, you don't need to be a geographer. Pakistan is a huge country. It's really, really big. Third of that, that there is absolutely no way that this can happen. And in fact, satellite data shows that the recent uh, floods uh, um, were about 55,000 square miles out of total area of almost 800 square miles. So that's about six or 7%. It's still a big flood, still a big flood, but it actually has nothing to do with climate change because data shows us quite clearly, and this is well, well documented, that monsoon rays in Pakistan are actually decreasing rather than increasing. And this has to do with the fact that, you know, the people of Pakistan are going into cities and they're uh, uh, building their houses along the rivers and they are very poor. So they don't have ways to build them very well. So once again, uh, uh, this is, and of course, a million examples in, in papers like that. That's very, very easy to find in everything, by the way. However, what I want to talk to show you is that uh, Alex Epstein missed two extremely important features of the climate system. The one feature, the first feature, is that biases in the knowledge system accumulate. And this is, of course, almost trivial, right? If there's some sort of bias in the research community, then it will be picked up by the synthesizers, right? Simply because they have no choice, right? It, uh, uh, there are... 10 papers, nine of them say one thing and one says the other. It doesn't matter that possibly the one is correct, right? And we all know this can happen in, in science, right? The fact that something was published doesn't mean that it's true. It just means that it's up for debate. But the synthesizer will have this bias uh, accumulated in the reports. Now, of course, once there's bias in synthesizers, the disseminators, the news outlet will pick up that bias and enhance it. And of course, once the evaluators see this bias, they will say, oh, we have to spend more money on these nine out of 10 cases, and they will put money into this. And this brings me to the next inherent feature of the knowledge system, which was totally missed by Alex, and that it's not a linear system. It's a feedback loop system, right? It has a intrinsic feedbacks within the different parts of the system, and they are very, very uh, uh, real and very apparent, right? So researchers and synthesizers are typically the same people or from the same group of people. So they interact with each other. So all the political pressure and the peer pressure 
the tapered scene would also happen here. Now, of course, synthesizers want disseminators to acknowledge them, right? They want to be out there in the media. And of course, uh, disseminators put press public, press a uh, pressure on the evaluators. Now the evaluators put money back onto the synthesizers on the committees and they use the authors of the reports as expert advice, right? So that's what? Yes, right. Oh, and it, this is, of course, the most important uh, feedback, right? That, and, and, and I should have put a larger arrow here. This is the most important uh, uh, feedback because in the Western and practically all over the world now, science is dominated by, by government funding. So this is a, a crucial step, and this is what I would like to show to demonstrate. And let me demonstrate, uh, I, I, I'm going to give two examples. And the second example will, will uh, connect the dots to DEI. Um, of course, uh, you can look, for example, about what happened to funding for climate research, actually climate crisis research. And uh, uh, this is uh, 1990. And here was the famous uh, appearance of uh, Jim Hansen in front of the US Congress. And then you see, a uh, rise of funding, which is about 15 fold. From the 90s up to these days, the, the, the funding for climate science has gone up uh, by a factor of 15. That's a really, really big number. And of course, it's reflected in the output, right? What you see here as a function of year is the number of climate change journals popping out, of course, receiving public money. And well, if you have the journals, then uh, uh, they will be filled with papers, right? So you have a very, very, you know, uh, understandable correlation between funding and number of papers and number of, of researchers and number of departments. And of course, a, a, a world news, right? So this is a, a funding, so, so evaluators, uh, researchers and uh, uh, disseminators all at once in one grant. So the interplay is quite uh, obvious. It also makes uh, sense. And, and you can actually see what happens every time uh, the IPCC sends out a report. You kind of see a change. This is most uh, uh, visible here. You can actually see a change in funding and then a change in the number of papers coming out from that same field. So we know that there is a, a feedback loop. And you can say, okay, fine, the government has a, 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 a right to put money where it thinks is right. But there is a problem with that because the first problem of the knowledge system, which biases accumulate. So now everyone is talking about CO2 and very few people are talking about a solar a, a wind. Maybe that's more important. We don't know. Right, because the a, a distribution of funding that goes into this into researching this thing is not uniform. Right, so we are a, a, a hurting science, but we're hurting science in a much much deeper way, because these kinds of biases eventually a, a diffuse into a, a other ways that that we are forced into doing science, and the second example is the meta-evaluator, the United Nations, which has a, um, a, a subsection called UNESCO. This is the UN a, a portion of a, education. So this is the, the part of the UN which is responsible for educating a, the human population on Earth. And they came up with, um, with a document in describing the sustainable development goals. Basically saying, if we want to have a sustainable uh, development, we want to have a sustainable future, these are what, this is what we need to do. Of course, there's a cyclic argument there if you actually read the document because uh, sustainable development is a development which achieves these goals, right? So, <laughs> and of course, to achieve a, a sustainable development, you must have reduced inequalities and gender equality and quality education and good health and zero hunger and no poverty 
and affordable energy and climate action, of course, and life below water. You know, we are everything that is good and nothing that is bad. It's kind of a ridiculous statement. However, they specify quite clearly what needs to be done. And this is where uh, things become tricky because they, you can actually read it. These are the links. And there's a, um, a, a document saying this is what higher education institutions need to do in order to move forward to Agenda 2030, to this sustainable development. And this is what they, it says, right? This is the document. It says, for example, higher education institutions need to use the knowledge they produced and their education of new professionals, so no longer students, but new professionals, to help solve some of the world's greatest problems as addressed by the SDG uh, document. So the goal of the university is no longer to seek uh, the truth. And it's no longer to acquire knowledge. The goal of the university is now uh, uh, to help solve some of the world's greatest problems. That's a big change of paradigm, right? And of course, a, a made sustainability and SDG literacy core requisites for all faculty members and students, because you must learn about the SDG goals, no matter if you're a mathematics student or a, a quantum chemist, you must know about the danger of sustainability. And of course, this, this call, the call this report makes is for the universities to play an active part in an agenda. It's written black and white. I mean, there's no conspiracy here. There's no scheme in some dark room, right? It's out there. The, uh, if you want the top uh, 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 institute in the world concerned about the education of future generations is telling us that we must be part of an agenda. No longer seeking the truth, but working toward the agenda that they wrote down. And this is what they say about a, a freedom of thought and academic freedom. The higher education institutions should not cease to protect and expand academic freedom. The, there should have been a comma here. There should have been a point here, right? No, no. For the promotion of systemic change. So you, you can a, a expand academic freedom, but only if it works towards systemic change. It's no longer a must in the academic system, but only if it helps. Right? Basic and curiosity-driven research, which is what I do, should also be maintained as a core principle where relevant. <laughs> Black and white. I mean, it's, you, so I told you this, this is sad laughter, right? right? It's unbelievable. Uh, and then they say, oh, there are ways that to ensure that, right? We recommendations for higher institutions. Oh, sorry, sorry. Why, why did I do that? Right? First of all, higher, and higher education institutions should consider establishing the post of chief SDG officer or a sustainability committee. What's the word for committee in Russian? <laughs> right? The Soviet. Right? So we will have a committee telling us whether or not the study of the chiral induced spin selectivity in molecular junctions supports the SDG goal. And if it's not, sorry, you're not going to study that. I know, I know, it's, it's, it's what's interesting to you, but it's just not part of the agenda. And then, of course, the higher education institutions must refuse to engage in research that supports non-sustainable practices. Who will decide whether or not, you know, a, a Riemann elliptic curves are sustainable or not sustainable goals, right? The commissar. Right? <laughs> he will decide. This is the end of academia as we know it. It is. If these goals are accepted, if the university signs a, this a, a participation in this agenda, it is the end of academia as we know it. It's as, as simple as that. So, and of course, this is already happening in Barcelona. A, a, there was a student riot. And of course, the, the administration came in. And now all students have to take classes on climate change and sustainability, even if they are studying pure mathematics or, or quantum chemistry. It doesn't matter. They need to know 
that the world is going up in flames, right? So this is the system we have. The question is, what can be done? I don't have a lot of answers. I can, I can give my thoughts and I would love to hear your thoughts, of course. First of all, we need to be aware of the flaws in the knowledge system. We need to consider those. Every time we read a news article, every time we see a report, every time an administrator in the university comes to us and tells us, you know, give me your expert advice, we need to be knowledgeable about these flaws in the system, and we should try to uh, actively correct these flaws. And uh, as, of course, science literacy is a must at all levels of education. This was already mentioned here. This is a big problem. So what can be done, I'm dividing it to, to three levels. On a personal level, what helped me is to study philosophy of science, actually to try to understand what it is that we are doing here, what it is that I'm doing that when I'm solving an equation and getting a, 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 a list of points and comparing them to experiment, what is it that I'm doing? That helped me a lot. And of course, one needs to be aware of your own biases because we are all human beings and we all work with biases. And, and uh, knowing that is first, step towards avoiding them. On the institutional level, well, we are doing it right now, right? We're organizing resistance to these changes of paradigm in the structure of, of academia. This is a, a part of the resistance. We need to debate. We need to participate in committees. We need to participate in Senate committees and, and, and engage and object vocally, right? We need to be heard. I mean, the fact that we are all sitting here is all nice and well, but I'm preaching to the choir here, right? We need to send this out to people who disagree with us and debate them and, and, and confront them with this paper from, the, from, the, from UNESCO and tell them, is this what you want for academia in Israel or in the US or wherever? And on the national level and global level, that's very, very, very hard. I don't know what to do. I mean, First of all, we need to participate in funding discussions and politics, right? I mean, there are other models of funding, except get your, all your funding money from, from the government. For example, I worked in Los Alamos National Laboratory, and in a, a Los Alamos National Laboratory, you get funding if you work for a goal you, on some specific project, and then you can get funding to do your own stuff. That's a different model of funding. It's local, but you know, it works. They have fantastically good science. We need to engage in global discussions. Of course, again, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, uh, our, our distinguished speakers are all well known for doing that. And again, we need to object vocally, right? Write papers, uh, uh, interviews, whatever we can to uh, shine light on these uh, uh, things. And I want to finish with a quote from uh, uh, Eisen, Eisenhower. So he was a smart man. As it turns out, in 1962, uh, uh, he was voted out of office. And, and in his farewell speech, which is very well known, uh, he writes this. In this technological revolution, research is central. Right? It says, today, the solitary inventor tinkering, tinkering in his shop has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists in laboratories and testing fields. In the same fashion, the free university, historically, the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery has experienced a revolution in conduction of research. This is 1962. See how visionary he was. Government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. And he's warning us from two dangers. First, the prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present is gravely to be regarded. So this is from a, a policymakers funding down to academia, but he's also warning us that in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, we should also, we, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. And I would change that he was almost correct. We should maybe write here, pseudo-scientific a, a social elite, but this is the, the a feedback loop, right? This is it. It was already recognized 
by Dwight Eisenhower in 1962. And this is something we should all think about uh, um, all the time, I guess. Thank you very much for your attention.